Good afternoon. Well, let's try it again. Good afternoon. <laughs> there you go. Welcome to those online. Hey, we are so glad that you are here with us today. It's, are you expecting God to do something? I am. I don't know about you, but I am, right? Today is the beginning of Holy Week, right? And so what is Holy Week? Well, Holy Week is something that we observe here at, uh, that in, Christians observe. We observe it here at church too, right? Get my mouth working this morning. And so the way it looks is that it is, uh, it starts with Palm Sunday and it goes to, uh, it goes to Good Friday, right? And then we're going to look at uh, the resurrection, which is Easter Sunday, which is next week. Now for today, I want to focus in on Good Friday. But one of the things I want to do is I'm going to teach you about some stuff, but then I want to end in uh, communion. So everybody should have got communion when they came in, right? Yes, yes, Pastor Sam, we got it, good, good. Okay, so you have it. So here's the thing online, people. I want you to participate, okay? We want you to do it because we're going to take it as a family. So go into your refrigerator or wherever you are around you, get something, juice or water, whatever, and some bread, right? Don't worry about it because God's going to consecrate it right where you are. He's not limited by you not having a little prepare package, okay? All right, so while this is happening, what I want to do is that my customary ways are always to stop before I teach and to ask the Holy Spirit to come even more. And so bow your heads with me, and I'm going to do that. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Yep. Holy Spirit, I ask that you just move throughout this auditorium, that you'd move over the, way, yeah, over the airwaves right now. Yep. Father God, that you would touch the hearts of those that have ears to hear what you are saying this morning, Lord. I ask, Father, that you would awaken the spirit, Lord, where there is uh, complacency and quietness. I ask that you would awaken it, Father. We take spiritual authority in this room, Father God. And I thank you that you're releasing your energy and your power, Father. I thank you, Lord, that today is like no other day as we enter into the holiest week of, of the year, Lord that we would see you and we would embrace you and that we would know what you're all about. And I thank you, Father. Take these simple words and do your profound work. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, I do want to talk about Good Friday. I want to talk about uh, the death of Christ on the cross. Holy Week is all about remembering that last week that he lived amongst us, right? And so today I'm going to focus in on Good Friday. Even though it's Palm Sunday, Palm Sunday was the celebration of Jesus entering Jerusalem on the donkey. And many of you who went to Sunday school, you know what that is, right? Well, I'm going to skip over that because I want to focus on, like I said, Good Friday. And here's Good Friday is uh, Jesus on the cross. And Jesus says seven things from the cross. I do not have time to go all over all seven, but there is one phrase that he says that shook my soul and my spirit, and I want to bring that to you today, okay? And uh, I'm going to reaccount it for you, but in the Gospels, which is found in the New Testament, the four Gospels up front, they all have the accounting of Jesus going to the cross, his last words, and his death, right? And so you can read those on your own, but I'm going to home in on something that uh, the disciples recorded about Jesus when he went to the cross. It's found in John 19, and it says this, Jesus knew that by now everything had been completed. That means his mission was being completed, was done. And he said, I am thirsty, right? I am thirsty. He's been hanging on the cross now for a long time. And so the, uh, the soldiers will put a spear up with, with uh, a sponge that has sour wine, and they're going to put it in Jesus' face. And it says, Jesus drank the wine, but he just let it hit his lips, right? And he said this. He said, it is finished. It is finished. And this is what we're going to look at today. It is finished. And then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit, right? And so what I want to talk to you about today is this word that he says, it is finished, right? This is a victorious word. We hear words all the time that are, are victorious, you know, that, that have great meaning to them. And so they're victorious. And we see them in movies. You, you hear them in speeches. You hear them all over, right? Like here's one. Um, Patrick Henry said, give me liberty or give me death, right, in the American Revolution. So we know these. We know these. We've studied them. We've heard them. Well, this, it is finished, is actually a, a, a victorious thing that Christ is, is saying. Now, here's the, the ironic part about it. Nobody understood what was going on. Nobody really understood it. 
You see, the, Ro the Roman soldiers that had just put him on the cross, they looked, and when he said, it is finished, I think they stepped back and they go, yep, another criminal dead, right? And then there were the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They stood around, and they had actually uh, convicted him and sentenced Jesus to death on the cross. They stood there. They watched, and when he said, it is finished, I think in their mind they said, yeah, our competition is gone. That guy that said he was Messiah, he's now out of here, right? Even Pontius Pilate, right? I can see him washing his hands and saying, one more political headache gone, right? So this word, it is finished, was confounding to lots of folks, I believe, even to the disciples. You see, I think when they heard, it is finished, they bowed their heads and said, our dream is gone, and we are finished, right? And I also think that in the heavenly Satan, he looked down and he saw Jesus on the cross. He saw the Son of God on the cross. And I believe he said, ha, I won, I killed God. You see, nobody understood what it meant. It is finished. But I want you to notice, it says, it is finished. Jesus didn't say, I am finished. He said, it is finished. So what was he referring to? Was he referring to his pain and suffering and humiliation of the cross? could be but you see it's so much more and that's what I want to share with you today I want to show you five ways five things that he finished on the cross that hits and and impacts our lives in 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 this year right and so I want to take a look at those what did Jesus complete on the cross number one Jesus fulfilled what God had promised us he fulfilled a promise that God had given us. You see, all throughout history, it's recorded in the, the uh, Old Testament. God is constantly uh, saying, I'm going to send the Messiah. I'm going to send the Savior of the world. He'll forgive your sins, right? He, he'll, uh, he'll bring restoration. And, and so we have this Messiah that everybody's been looking for for uh, just thousands of years. You have prophecies, you've got predictions, and you've got the promises, right? And when Jesus died, he fulfilled every one of them. And this can be confusing to people. Sometimes they get confused with this, right? Even the disciples were confused. But when Jesus uh, returned back to earth, he was resurrected. This is what he said to his disciples. He said this. He said, uh, Jesus said, this is what I told you when I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled. It must happen, right? Be fulfilled. That is written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and in the Psalms. The Christ will suffer and raise from the dead. And on the third day, on that third day, and repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in the name to all nations. Is that not what's going on now? Am I not preaching the good news? Yes. Do you not preach the good news? Yes. But here's how this really comes in full force with you today, right? You know, God gave us over 7,000 promises in the Bible. God keeps promises. That's why this is important. He's given you promises, and he wants you to go to the Bible, and he wants you to find them, and he wants you to believe that he's going to make those come about. Now, as I was preparing this lesson, I completed it, and on Saturday, the Holy Spirit spoke to me. He said, speak this this weekend. So I speak it to you. God has given you certain uh, promises, promises that you've held on for years and years, and the temptation is to walk away from them, but don't. Father God says they are going to come about because it is not by your doing, but by his. He says you can stand on that promise. It will happen. And see, so this is the importance of understanding that on the cross, Jesus shows us that the promise will be fulfilled. Now, the second thing he does is Jesus satisfies what God's judgment required. That he satisfied the judgment that God required. And that can be kind of heavy, but I want you to know that our God is a holy God. Our God is a just God. Our God is a fair God. You see, people, we're not fair. But God, he's always fair. Why? Because he's always perfect. Matter of fact, he made you and I, right? He made you and I, and he made us in his image. And you know what? Deep down inside of us, we yearn for fairness, right? We yearn when we see injustice. Do we not cry out? Yes, we earn for it. We want it, right? We want justice. That's part of how God has made us. We are reflecting him. He is a, a, a just God, right? He's, he's a God of fairness. And so we want that. We want that from the creator, right? 
As a matter of fact, the creator God, when he made the whole world, he gave certain laws and he set them in motion, right? Like what, Sharon? Well, the laws of physics, the laws of chemistry, even mathematics. He set them all, when he created the world, he set them all in motion for all of us. Why? Because he knew that that would keep the universe going the way it is, right? And so he set it in motion. He's a, he's a brilliant God, and he put it all together. But he didn't just write laws uh, for, the, for nature, right, for the universe. He wrote them for us. He gave us laws. They gave us moral laws, spiritual laws, right? You can go to the Old Testament, and you can read at the beginning when he gave them. He gave them to Moses, right? He gave Moses the Ten Commandments. And so those are moral laws. And so God writes those, and he says, here, I'm going to give them to you, not just to the Israelites, but to all people for all time. Why? Because he wants us to know that his commandment is true. And if we will enact it, you will have peace in the land. You'll have peace with your brother. You'll be able to live a life as a child of God. But it comes by putting into play those those uh, laws, those commandments that he's given us. Now, here's the two problems I see with this, right? The first one is that we, we can't keep the perfect law. We, can't, we just can't make all the, the commandments happen, right? I mean, I think there are some of you, you do a pretty good job, right? You keep some of the laws some of the time, right? But there is none of us that can keep all the laws at all times, why? Because we're imperfect. We hurt people. We make mistakes. We even hurt ourselves. And so we can't uphold the commandments that God gives us. We're not able to. And then the second thing I see here is that there is this law that, uh, that God has given us, right? This, this perfect law. And when we don't hit that, we don't make that, then we fall short. And when we fall short, there's a penalty that needs to be paid for that. Right? Let me explain. If I break the law, right? If I break the law, we would think that, oh, there has to be consequences to one's behavior. Right? Like, like this. If I stole something from you and the law found out, right, you, and nothing happened, you would be crying out like, wait a minute, that's not fair. Right? Because there's a fairness down inside of us. And you see, that's what God has done. He's put the the, the concept of fairness down inside of us. And we so desire that because we reflect God. Now, those two things I was sharing with you, how come we struggle? Look at what the scriptures say here. The law of Moses was, able to, was unable to save us because of the weakness of our sinful nature. Law number one. All of us cannot satisfy the laws all the time because we're human right? So God did what the law could not do. He's changing his plans. He's bringing in another element. He sent his own son in a body like the bodies we sinners have, right? God declared an end to sin's control over you by giving you his son as a sacrifice. So he who no knew, he didn't know any sins, Jesus was the only one that could walk the earth and keep all the commandments at all times. He is now going to come as a sacrifice for you and I who could not keep it. So the son is a sacrifice for our sins. He did this so that the just requirement, here's the law, the just requirement of the law would be fulfilled, fully satisfied for us, who no longer follow our sinful nature, but instead follow the spirit. And so what I want you to see here is that we can be successful at following God's commands now because the Holy Spirit has set us free, okay? That's what happened on the cross. We are completely able to, to do what the Lord asks of us now, right? So Jesus came and he sacrificed his own body, his own self, so that he could satisfy the holiness of God. The second thing, or the third thing I want to share with you is that Jesus paid off the debt I owed. And it comes right back, the sacrifice... And then what happens as a result of the sacrifice? Our debt is paid, right? Our debt is paid. You see, when you hurt somebody, when you, when you do something wrong, right? When you, when you offend somebody, do you not owe them an apology at least to say, I'm sorry, right? We do. But see, what happens here is that our sins, the place we fall short, it makes this huge long list and we are indebted. It reminds me of the credit card. You know, my kids say that when they were younger, they used to call the credit card the magic card. Why? Because you can go swipe it anywhere you like, right, and get what you want. It's magic until you get the bill, 
right? Am I speaking truth? Right? Okay, so what's happening here is that people are, are stacking up offenses. They're stacking them up, and they become very long, very tedious ones. And I wanted you so to understand this. So you're going to laugh here, but I actually went to the chi- children's Bible, right? Because I think the scripture is so good there. It's, uh, that's what ICB, it's children's Bible, okay? And it says this, we owed a debt because we'd broken God's laws. Like, yes. Right? That debt listed all the rules we'd failed to follow. I want you to see here, that debt listed, that's our debt. I have my own debt, you have your own debt, each and every person has a debt, right? And it's got a list on every time I, I spoke unkindly, every time I lied, even if it was a white lie, every time I've cheated, I didn't play the way I was supposed to play, right? Every time we do something, we rack up this long list. But here comes the hope, guys. But God forgave us our debt. There you go. He forgave it. And he canceled our debt by nailing it to the cross. That's why the cross is so dear to me, because my sins is what were nailed there with him. Do you see that? It's remarkable when you look at the cross if you really understand what it represents. And so we need to know that our debt was so huge, and it's been forgiven. And I think sometimes we don't get that. I think sometimes we struggle with that, right? It's like, it's like that credit card I was talking to you about. If, if you had yours and you went home and you got a phone call from the bank and they said, dear, you know, Sharon or so-and-so, we're canceling all your credit card debt. Oh, <laughs> you've been set free. It's like you never even did anything with it. What would my response be? I'd be like, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, right? The higher the debt, the more, oh, yeah, right? So, Because we understand the indebtedness to which we were and the total freedom we have. My friends, it's not, not what Christ has done. He has freed us from the debt. And because of that, there should be great rejoicing when we're singing about our King Jesus. I can hardly contain myself. Right? Why? Because I understand that which he has forgiven us for. He's forgiven me for. And it makes me want to sing loud. Now, why am I, why am I hanging here? Because here's what I find. I find that people that gave their life to Christ, that they go back as if they were indebted. So some calamity that hits you, right? This is how it looks. Some calamity that hits you, you go back and you go, oh, that's because I had this sin in my life, right? Oh, I can't have children because I had an abortion. Oh, so-and-so passed away because I wasn't good enough to, to do something. Oh, you know, I'm in, I'm in, I, I can't have this business. It fell apart because when I was younger, I cheated. And so we link it to our sins. But yet, if we really understood what happened at the cross, Christ completely forgives us our sins, right? The ones we have presently that we're doing, but the ones we've committed years ago, they're under the blood. The ones today are under the blood. And the ones, let me blow your mind, that you're going to do in the future, under the blood. He's forgiven you for that. So you're forgiven. Your debt is taken away. It's wiped clean, right? So all those bad mistakes, all those bad judgments and things you wish you never did and stuff. You know what God does? Jesus Christ, with his death, he throws them as far as the east is to the west. He remembers them no more. And that's what we should do. We should remember no more. And we're told in scripture to be careful. When our sins are forgiven, there is no more need for sacrifice. He's saying to us, Line up one's behavior with what's really happened with the cross. Watch what comes out of your mouth, right? Line it up. All right, now the next two, are, two I want to share with you that talk about it is finished, right? These two here, if you really grab a hold of them, they just revolutionize the way you live. Here you go. Jesus defeated the fear of death. Now, I have been privileged to, to be able to travel a lot all around the world, and I can tell you that in every country I've went and every time I talk, that people are fearful of death. That's like the number one fear <laughs> right up there. It's, it's, fear, it's universal. The fear of death is universal, right? And in case you think I'm kidding, go home and at Easter when you have your friends come over, right, you're having a party, just sit them all down and go, <laughs> have a drink or two and say, let's talk about death. What a party killer that is, right? <laughs> go home and try it. Nobody likes to talk about death or the fear of death. They just don't like to talk about it. But it is a universal fear. But then when Christ died on the cross and he said, it is finished, he took on death. That's what he was talking about. Look at this scripture with me. 
For only as a human being could die. Stop for a moment. Do you realize that God cannot die? And so God, part of him coming down in the form of a human being was so that he could be the sacrifice, that he could die, right? And only by dying could he break the power of the devil. So the dying is what is, the dying of Christ is why the power is broken that the devil had. He had the power of death, right? And Christ took that back. Only in this way, now this is our promise, could he set free, that means all of you guys, that means me, he set us free, who have lived their whole lives slaves to the fear of dying. You see, the fear of dying, it, it, it's, it's prevalent, it's everywhere, right? And so we need to be able to know that we can walk with confidence. You see, when Jesus came and died on the cross, he defeated death. He showed you. It's not just a guess because in a week, we're going to talk about the resurrection. Our Jesus comes back to life. It's like they put him in the grave and he pops back out and goes, I'm back. Right? He came back to life. To everybody's surprise, he came back to life just as he said he would. But in dying, he took on Satan. He took on death and he defeated it. Now, knowing that should change your perspective. It changed my perspective. When I really understood this, it changed our perspective. How so, Sharon? Well, whenever you go to a funeral and you're sitting back there, it's like, okay, it's done. Everything's done. It's final. The act is done, right? And it just, and it just feels, you know, like it's just the end. You die. Your dust goes into the ground or your body does and it turns to dust. And it's all over. But you see, Jesus challenges that thought. He says, No. The body might be earthly, but the spirit is eternal. And so yet your body dies, the spirit lives. And that's what Christ was showing us, that there is a, a, a eternity that waits for us. So my friends, I'm going to challenge something in your life, that indeed, that death is not the final act. It is only intermission. It is only a transport from this life to the next life. And we need to have that perspective. And when we have that perspective, you go to a funeral, of somebody that knows Christ, you're like, yay, because the second act is beginning for them. They are really living as they were meant to be, as a spiritual being. You see, what I want to do is challenge your thought right now on death because it feels so final, it feels so painful. But yet I want to remind you that we are spiritual beings, that there is an eternity, and God is in control of that. He's in control of that, and we need to have confidence now, here comes the fifth one that can just radically change the way you live. Is this. He destroyed Satan's power to control me. I love this. You know, when he got on the cross, he destroyed Satan's power. He cannot control me. He cannot control you. He cannot control the children of God. You see, Satan is your enemy. Don't kid yourself. He's your enemy. That's where all evil comes through to mankind. It comes through Satan. And Jesus destroyed Satan's power, right? And you know, when he got on the cross, when Jesus got on the cross, you saw the body of Jesus on the cross. But what we didn't see is behind the scenes, the scripture talks about, there was a cosmic battle going on for good and evil. And when Satan saw him die, he's like, yay, I win. But he did not win because Jesus had in mind that God would resurrect him from the dead three days later. And we need to have that same perspective. We need to know that, that Satan took on death and he defeated it, right? And so here you go. Anybody that's accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, right? And the Holy Spirit lives inside of you. Let me tell you, you are victorious. Satan has no control over your life. Zero. He has no control. I know you're going, well, wait a minute, Sharon. Wait a minute. Are you sure he has no control? Because he sure does seem like there's a lot going on. Well, listen, he has no control unless you give it to him. Okay? You have to give it back to him. You have to actually give Satan back because, see, Jesus took it all away. He can't control me and he can't control you. And so many people that don't have Jesus Christ, they are controlled by Satan. They have to go with the whims of whatever Satan wants to do, the evil that he brings in and ushers in through them. But as Christ followers, we can break that. We can break that in our lives and share the gospel with other people to break it in their lives. Listen, Satan is your enemy. He tries to manipulate you and, and do things to you. Even as a believer, he'll try to come and, and talk to you. And you need to know his schemes. So what are the two major schemes that Satan uses? 
Do you use this temptation? Then use this condemnation. Okay, those are the two, right? Temptation. Uh, go ahead. Do that. It don't matter. Nobody's watching. And dang it, you deserve it. You've, you've earned it, right? And so he convinces us. He plays on us. And he gets us where we minimize the rebellion that happens when we grab hold of the, the, um, the temptation, right? And the minute, listen, the minute you buy into temptation and you bite into it, do you know what comes right after that? The voice of condemnation that says, I knew you were going to do that. You couldn't do anything but that. You're just a failure. You're a phony. You're a fraud. God's never going to love you. That's the accuser. That's the accuser speaking to us, right? And we allow Satan back into our life to accuse us if we're not on the ball and knowing that's his voice, not God's. Listen to what God has given us that we know that we can take care of these two things. First is temptation. God says, God has freed us, that's me and you, from the power of darkness, which is temptation, and brought us into the kingdom of his dear son. So when we stay in the son, in the Holy Spirit, we are able to always defeat the darkness, the temptation. And I know it's true. Okay, I just heard that. So here you go. In my spirit, I just heard that, no, I can't, I can't stand under temptation. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. You can because you have the Holy Spirit, and greater is he that's in you than he that is in the world. Amen. Greater is he that's in you. You can do this. God has given you the ability to do it, to stand up and to turn away from temptation. The next thing here is condemnation. What did Christ do for us at the condemnation? God took away Satan's power to accuse you of sin. So that voice that comes accusing you, guess what? It cannot go to God and accuse you, right? Because God said, no, I don't, I don't hear it. I took that sin. I threw it away from the east is to the west. It's no longer in front of me, right? And so he took our, our sins. And I love this part because he doesn't do it privately. You know, like when you try to cover something, you go, let it go. It's okay. And we do it privately. No, no, no. God wanted to make sure everybody knew that he took away your sins. Look at this. And God openly displayed to the whole world Christ's triumph at the cross where your sins were all taken away. He didn't just whisper. He yelled it out. So when he's yelling out, it is finished, he's saying that Satan has no more power over you. And so he says it very loudly, very clearly, very declaratively right? Now, I know some of you are going, well, wait a minute, Sharon. I still see Satan. He's kind of, you know, around me all the time. Well, yeah, that's part of being in this world. Let me tell you, I was praying about that, and I was thinking about, I've talked to you before where I live. I live near the Elizabeth Washes, right, where the estuary comes up, and the water ebbs and flows, and it's about two blocks away. So I get all manner of wildlife that will come into my yard, right? And I tell you, for the longest time, snakes. Snakes would come into my yard, right? And you know what? Snakes aren't welcome. And I don't want to hear anything that you guys have to say. They're just not welcome, right? Not welcome in my yard. And so every time they come in, though, I don't turn my back and pretend they're going to go away. No, I go find my shovel, and I go after them. I go attack that, and I cut off their head, right? I cut off their head because they're not allowed in my yard, and let me tell you what I noticed. When I cut off their head, they're always wiggling. I separated the head from the body, and it's still wiggling, and I'm looking. And you could be deceived to think it's still alive, but it's dead. It's dead. Listen, Jesus Christ went to the cross. He defeated death. He defeated Satan. He cut Satan's head off. He has no control. He's dead. He just doesn't know it. He's wiggling it around you, but he is dead. Take it on my word. He is dead. Right, it's something to be so intensely truth that can actually transform the way we deal with everything that's around us. Satan has no control of you. His days are numbered. He's just wiggling around us. That's why I don't take my cue from culture. He's just wiggling around us, right? We are the culture setters. We are the ones that are to be the, the thermostat in an environment where we set it to the truth. We're not to be a thermometer and just reflect, but we're to set our culture. And we're going to do that by remembering what Jesus did on the cross for us. Now, I want you to stand up. I want you to stand up right now because we're going to take our communion. Guys that are watching online, I want to encourage you to go get your juice if you don't already have it and your bread. 
And those that are in the audience, right, we're going to go over these five facts that we talked about, right? We're going to go over that Jesus died, right? In Jesus' death, we see that he fulfilled the scriptures. He's our promised Messiah, our Savior. We also saw that he satisfied uh, the need for judgment, God's holiness, his judgment, and that he forgave us our debts, right, that we are set free. And then he wants us to have a different perspective. So he rose again, showing us that he defeated the fear of death in our lives. And then lastly, that he, Satan has no control over you. These are all things that the cross projects to us, but they are potentially yours. Potentially? What do you mean potentially? Well, this is why they're potentially yours. Because you have to accept them. You have to use your words to accept them. Okay? You have to use your words to accept them. And so I want to encourage you today, those of you that are far from God, I want you to use your words. They're powerful. I taught this and worked with my small group that the words that we speak, they are oh so powerful. So if you're far from God, when we are uh, getting ready to take communion, and I'm going to do a responsatory communion today, which is where I'll tell you something, and you'll say it back to me, right? In that, if you are far from God, let that, let that be known by the confession of your mouth and the belief in your heart, so shall you be saved. And so as you pronounce these, this is coming home to God. And for those of us that have walked with God, is this not the Holy Week? Is this not the time that we remember what our God has done in providing Jesus Christ for us? I say it is. Now, I heard you guys fumbling around on your packages. I hope you knew to replace, to pull up the little foil, right? I think that's what the giggles was. If you don't pull up the foil, you'll never find your bread, <laughs> okay? And then you can pull off the foil. If you got it reversed, got it backwards, that's okay. We have extras. Just go grab your one. Just walk back to the door and grab it, okay? All right, here you go. Here's what I want to do. I want you to lift up the bread. This bread represents the body of Jesus Christ that was broken for us, right? And I want to remember it by having you respond back to me, the words I give you. You just say, Jesus, I recognize that you fulfilled the promise. I accept your forgiveness for my sins today. yesterday and in the future and Jesus I accept your gift of salvation today take the communion with me thank you Jesus now lift up your cup So this juice represents the blood that was shed on the cross for you and for me. It represents the new covenant by which we operate with God. So repeat after me. I recognize the old is gone. I choose today to have the Holy Spirit lead me. I have confidence in eternal life. Take the juice with me. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> Holy Spirit, I thank you that you were here today. I thank you that you moved amongst the people. And Lord, the scriptures that you gave me that were in Philippians 1, 6, where it says to encourage us, it says, the good work that I, Jesus Christ, has begun in each one of you that are in the vineyard and those watching online, the good work that he began in you, he is faithful to bring it to completion. When it is finished, he will do this for you. In Jesus' name.